Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual Vertica BDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled A Deep Dive into the Vertica Management Console Enhancements and Roadmap. I'm Jeff Healy. I'll be Vertica Marketing. I'll be your host for this breakout session. Joining me are Bhavik Gandhi and Natalia Stavisky from Vertica Engineering. But before we begin, I encourage you to submit questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait. Just type your question or comment in the question box below the slides or click Submit. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as we're able to during that time. Any questions we don't address, we'll do our best to answer them offline. Alternatively, visit Vertica Forms at forum.vertica.com. Post your questions there after the session. Our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going well after the event. Also, a reminder that you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides. And yes, this virtual session is being recorded and will be available to view on demand this week. We'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. Now let's get started. Over to you, Bhavik. All right. So hello and welcome, everybody, to in this presentation of Deep Dive into the Vertica Management Console. Enhancements and roadmap, myself, Bhavik, and my team member, Natalia Stavisky, will go over a few useful enhancements on Vertica Management Console, discussing a few real scenarios. All right. So today we will go forward with a brief introduction about the Management Console. Then we will discuss the benefits of using Management Console by going over a couple of user scenarios for taking uh, for the queries taking too long to run and receiving email alerts from Management Console. Then we will go over a few uh, MC features for Vertica Eon Mode databases like provisioning and reviving the Eon Mode databases from MC. Uh, managing the subcluster and understanding the depot. Then we will go over uh, some of the uh, future enhancements on MC that we are planning. All right, so let's get started. All right, so do you want to know about how to provision a new Vertica cluster from MC? Uh, how to analyze and understand the database workload by, monitor, uh, by monitoring the queries on the database? Uh, how do you balance the resource pools and use alerts and thresholds on MC? So the management console is basically your answer, and we'll talk about its capabilities and new enhancements in this presentation. So just to give a brief uh, overview of the management console, who uses management console? It's generally used by IT administrators and DB admins. Management console can be used to monitor both Eon mode and uh, enterprise mode databases. Why to use Management Console? You can use the Management Console for provisioning uh, Vertica databases and cluster. Uh, you can manage the already existing uh, Vertica databases and cluster you have. And you can use uh, various tools on Management Console like Query Execution, Database Designer, uh, Workload Analyzer, and set up alerts and thresholds to get notified some of your act uh, by uh, for the some of your activities on uh, on the MC. So. Let's go over a few benefits uh, of using Management Console. Um, okay. So using, uh, using Management Console, you can view and optimize the resource pool usage. Management Console helps you to identify some critical conditions on your Vertica cluster. Additionally, you can uh, set up various thresholds, and, uh, thresholds on MC and get alerted if those thresholds are triggered on the database. So now let's dig, in, dig into the couple of scenarios. Uh, uh, so for, uh, for the first scenario, uh, we will discuss about queries taking too long and using workload analyzer to possibly help to, uh, help to solve the problem. Uh, in the second scenario, we will go over an email, alert email that you received via management console and analyzing the problems and taking required actions uh, to solve the problem. So let's go over the scenario where t uh, queries are taking too long to run. So in this example, uh, we have this one query that we are running uh, using the query execution on MC. And for some reason, we noticed that it's taking about 14.8 second uh, seconds to execute this query, uh, which is higher than the expected runtime of the query. Uh, the query that we are running happens to be the query uh, used by MC during the external monitoring. Notice that the uh, the, uh, the table name and the schema name, which is DC request issued, and DC schema used for extended monitoring. 
Now in Tano MC, we have redesigned the workload analyzer and recommendations feature to show the recommendations and allow you to execute those recommendations. In our example, uh, we have taken the table name and filtered the tuning descriptions to see if there are any tuning uh, recommendations related to this table. Uh, as we see over here, there are three tuning recommendations available for that table. So now in Tano MC, you can select those recommendations and then run them. So let's run the recommendations. All right. So once uh, once the recommendations are uh, run successfully, uh, you can uh, you can go and see all the process recommendations that you have run previously. Over here, we see that uh, there are three recommendations that we had selected earlier have successfully processed. Now we take the same query and run uh, run it on the query execution on MC, and hey, it's running really faster. And we see it, it takes only. 0.3 seconds uh, to run the query, and uh, which is about like 98% decrease in original runtime of the query. So in this example, we saw that using a workload analyzer tool on MC, you can possibly triage and solve the issue for your queries which are taking too long to execute. All right. So now let's go over an, another uh, use case scenario where DB admin received some alert. Uh, alert email messages from MC and would like to understand and analyze the problem. So to know more uh, about what's going on on the database and proactively react to the problems, DB admins using the management console uh, can create set of thresholds and get alerted about the conditions on the database if the threshold values is reached and then respond to the problem thereafter. Now as a DB admin, I see uh, some email message notifications uh, from MC. And upon checking the emails, I see that there are a couple of email uh, alerts re uh, received from MC on my email. So one of the messages that I received was for query resource rejections greater than five for midpool seven. And then around, around the same time, I received another email uh, uh, from the MC for the failed queries greater than five. And in this case, I see there are 80 uh, failed queries. So now let's go on the MC and investigate the problem. So before going into the deep investigation about failure, uh, failures, uh, let's review the threshold settings on MC. Uh, so as we see, we have set up the thresholds uh, under the database settings page for failed queries in the uh, last 10 minutes greater than five, and uh, MC should send, in, uh, send an email to, an, to the individual if the threshold is triggered. And also we have a uh, threshold alert set up for queries and resource rejections in last five min minutes for mid post seven, uh, uh, set to greater than five. There are various other thresholds uh, on this page that you can set if you desire to. Now let's go and triage those email alerts about the failed queries and resource rejections that we had received. To analyze the failed queries, let's take a look at the query statistics page on the database overview page on MC. Let's take a look at the resource pools graph, and especially for the failed queries for each resource pools. And over to the right, under the failed query section, I see about, like, uh, in the last 24 hours, there are uh, about 6,000 failed queries for mid pool 7. And now I switch the view to, the, uh, to see the statistics for each user. And on this page, I see for user Mary Lee on the right-hand side, uh, the, uh, there are a high number of failed queries in the last 24 hours. And no more about the failed queries uh, for this user. I can click on the graph for this user uh, and get the reasons behind it. So let's click on the graph and see what's going on. And so clicking on this graph, uh, it takes me to the failed queries uh, view on the query monitoring page for data, uh, database activities tab. And over here, I see there are a high number of failed queries for this user, Mary Lee, uh, with the reasons stated, stated as exceeding high limit. To drill down more uh, and to know more reasons behind it, I can click on the plus icon on the left-hand side uh, for each failed queries to get the failure reason, reason for each node on the database. So let's do that. And clicking the plus icon, I see for the two nodes that are listed uh, over here, it says there are insufficient resources like memory and file handles for midpool 7. 
Now let's go and analyze the MIPPL 7 configurations and activities on it. So to do so, I will go over to the resourceful monitoring view and select MIPPL 7. Uh, I see the resource allocations for this resource pool is very low. For example, the max memory is just 1 MB and the max concurrency is set to 0. Hmm, that's very odd configuration for this resource pool. Also in the bottom right graph for the resource rejection for MIPPL 7, the graph shows very high values for resource rejection. All right. So since we saw some odd configurations and, uh, res and odd resource allocations for MIPPL 7, I would like to see when this uh, when the settings were changed on the resource pools. To, so to do this, I can review the audit logs on available on the management console. So I can go onto the Vertica audit logs and see uh, see the logs for the uh, for the resource pool. Uh, so adjusting the time range for the logs and filtering the logs for midpool seven, I see on uh, February February seventeenth the memory and other attributes for midpool 7 were modified so now let's analyze the resourceful activity for midpool 7 around the time when the configurations were changed so in our case we are using extended monitoring on mc for this database so we can go back in time and see the statistics uh, over the larger time range for midpool 7 so viewing the activities for midpool 7 around february 17th around the time when these configurations were changed we see a decrease in resource pool usage also uh, on the on the bottom right we see the resource rejections for this midpool 7 uh, has an increase uh, linear increase uh, after the configurations were changed i can select a point uh, on the graph uh, to get the more details about the resource rejections now to analyze the effects of the modifications on MIPPOOL 7, let's go over to the query monitoring page. I, I will adjust the time uh, time range around the time when the configurations were uh, changed uh, for MIPPOOL 7 and filter the activities queries for a user merely. And I see there are no completed queries for this user. Now uh, taking a look at the failed query step and adjusting the time range around the time when the configurations were changed, I can do so because we are using extended monitoring. So uh, again, adjusting the time, uh, I can see uh, there are a high number of failed queries for this user. There are about like 10,000 failed queries for this user uh, after the uh, configurations were changed on, on this resource pool. So now let's go and modify the settings since we know uh, after the configurations were changed, this user was not able to run the queries. So you can change the resourceful settings uh, of using management consoles, uh, database settings page and under the resourceful step. So selecting the midpool 7, I see the same odd configurations for this resource pool that we saw earlier. So now let's go and modify it, the settings. So I will increase the max memory and modify other settings for midpool 7 so that it has adequate resources to run uh, run the queries for the user. Hit apply uh, on the right hand top uh, to save the settings. Now let's do the validation after the after we change the resource pool attributes. So let's go over to the same query monitoring page and see if Mary Lee user uh, is able to run the queries for midpool 7. We see that uh, now, uh, after the configuration, after the cha after we change the configuration for midpool seven, the user can run the query successfully, and the count for completed queries has increased after we we modify the settings for the uh, this midpool seven resource pool. And also viewing the resource pool monitoring page, uh, we can validate that uh, after the new con uh, the new configurations for midpool seven has been applied. And also the resource pool usage uh, after the configuration change is, has increased. And also on the bottom right graph, uh, we can see that the resource rejections for midpool 7 is decreased over the time after we modified the settings. And since we are using extended, extended monitoring for this database, uh, I can see that the trending data for this resource pools uh, and the before and after effects of modifying the settings. So uh, the uh, Initially, when the uh, when the settings were changed, uh, there were high resource rejections, and after we again modified the settings, the resource resource rejections uh, went down. Right. 
So now let's go over to the provisioning and reviving the Eon mode Vodica database cluster using the management console on different platform. So management console supports uh, provisioning and reviving of Eon mode databases on various cloud environments like AWS, the Google Cloud Platform, and Pure Storage. So for Google, uh, for provisioning the Vodica management console on Google uh, Cloud Platform, you can use the launcher template or on AWS environment, you can use the cloud formation templates available for different OSs. Once you have uh, a provision Vertica Management Console, you can provision the Vertica cluster and databases from, uh, from MC itself. So you can, uh, to provision a new Vertica cluster, you can uh, select the Create New Database button uh, available on the home page. Uh, this will open up the wizard uh, to create a new database and cluster. Uh, in this example, we are using uh, uh, we are using the Google Cloud Platform. So the wizard will ask ask me for various authentication uh, parameters for uh, for the Google Cloud Platform. And if you are on AWS, it will ask you the authentication parameters for the AWS environment. And going forward on the wizard, uh, it will ask me to select the instance types I would like for the new Vertica cluster and also provide the combined location URL for my Eon mode database and all the other preferences uh, related to, to, to the new cluster. Uh, once, uh, once I have selected all the preferences uh, for my new cluster, I can review the settings and I can hit, uh, if I'm, uh, I can hit create uh, if all looks okay. So if I hit create, uh, this will create a new MC will create a new GC, uh, GCP instances uh, because we are we are on the GCP environment in this example. It will create the cluster on this instance. Uh, it will create the Vodica Eon mode database uh, on this uh, on this cluster, and it will uh, additionally you can load the test data on its on its uh, if you like to. Now let's go over and revive the uh, existing Eon mode database from the communal location. So you can do the same uh, for using the management console. Uh, by selecting the revive Eon mode database button on the home page. Uh, this will again open up the wizard for re reviving the Eon mode database. Uh, again, in this example, since we are using GCP uh, platform, uh, it will ask me for the Google Cloud Storage uh, at authentication attributes. And for reviving, uh, it will ask me the communal location so I can enter the Google Storage bucket and my folder. And it will discover all the data, Eon mode databases located under this uh, folder. And uh, I can select one of the databases that I would like to revive. And it will ask me for other Vertica preferences and uh, for this, re uh, for this uh, database reviving. And once I enter all the preferences uh, and review all the preferences, I can hit revive the database button on the wizard. Uh, so. Uh, after I hit Revive Database, it will create the GCP instances. The number of GCP instances that are created would be same as the number of hosts uh, on the original Vertica cluster. Uh, it will uh, install the Vertica cluster on this data on this uh, on these instances, and it will revive the database and it will start the data uh, start the database. And uh, after starting the database, uh, it will be imported on MC, so you can start monitoring on it. So in this example, we saw uh, you can re uh, provision and revive the uh, Vertica database on the GCP uh, cloud platform. Uh, uh, additionally, you can use the AWS environment to provision and revive. So now since we have the Eon mode database on MC, Natalia uh, will go over some Eon mode features on MC like uh, managing the subcluster and uh, depot activity monitoring. Over to you, Natalia. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Natalia Stavisky. I am also a member of Vertical Management Council team. And I will talk today about uh, the work we did to allow users to manage subclusters using the Management Council. And also the work we did to help users understand what's going on in their depot in their Vertica Eon mode database. So, Let's look at the picture of the subclusters. In the, on the Manage page of uh, Vertica Management Console, you can see here is a um, page that has two tabs, and the uh, tab that's active is subclusters. You can see that there are two subclusters are available in this database. 
And uh, for each of the subclusters, you can see subcluster properties, whether this is a primary subcluster or secondary. In this case, primary is the default subcluster. It's indicated by a star. You can uh, see what nodes belong to which subcluster. Uh, you can see the node state and node statistics. You can also easily add a new subcluster, and we are quickly going to do this. So once you click on the button, we launch the wizard. That will take you through a few steps. You'll enter the name of the subcluster, indicate whether this is secondary or primary subcluster. I should mention that uh, Vertica recommends having only one primary subcluster, but uh, we have both options here available. You will enter the number of nodes for your subcluster, and once the subcluster has been created, you can manage the subcluster. Uh, what other options for managing subcluster we have here? You can scale up an existing subcluster, and it's a similar approach. You launch the wizard, and you specify how many nodes you want to add to your existing subcluster. You can scale down a subcluster, and MC uh, validates requirements for maintaining minimal number of nodes to prevent database shutdown. So if not, if you cannot uh, remove any nodes from a subcluster, this option will not be available. You can stop a subcluster. And uh, depending on whether this is a primary subcluster or secondary subcluster, this option may be available or not available. Like in this picture, we can see that for the default subcluster, this option is not available. And this is because shutting down the default subcluster will cause the database to shut down as well. You can terminate a subcluster. And again, the MC warns you not to terminate the primary subcluster and validates requirements for maintaining minimal number of nodes to prevent database shutdown. So now we are going to uh, talk uh, a little more about how the MC helps you to understand what's going on in your depot. So Depo is uh, one of the uh, at the core of Eon Mode database. Um, and what are the frequently asked questions about the Depo? Is the Depo size sufficient? Are a subset of users putting a high load on the database? What tables are fetched and evicted repeatedly? We call it refetched in Depo. So here in the Depo activity monitoring page. We now have four tabs that allow you to answer those questions. And we'll go a little more in detail through each of them, but I'll just mention what they are for now. At a glance, shows you a basic a depot configuration and also shows you a query executing. Depot efficiency, we'll talk more about that and other tabs. Depot content, that shows you what tables are currently in your depot. And depot pinning allows you to see what pinning policies have been created and to create new pinning policies. Now, let's go through the scenario. Monitoring performance of workloads on one subcluster. As you know, Eon Mode database uh, allows users to have multiple subclusters, and we'll explore how this feature is uh, useful and how we can use a management console to make decisions regarding whether we would like to have multiple subclusters. So here we have, in my setup, a single subcluster called default subcluster. It has two users that are running queries that are accessing table, mostly in the schema public. So the query started executing, and we can see that after fetching tables from communal, which is a red line, the rest of the time the queries are 
executing in depot. The green line is indicating queries running in depot. The all nodes depot is about 88% full, a steady flow, and the depot size seems to be sufficient for query execution from depot only. That's the good case scenario. Now, at around 17.15, user Sherry got an urgent request to generate a report. And that she started running her queries. We can see that picture is quite different now. The tables Sherry is querying are in a different schema and are much larger. Now we can see multiple lines in different colors. We can see a bunch of fetches and evictions, which are indicated by blue and purple bars. And a lot of queries are now spilling into communal. This is red and orange lines. Orange lines in indicator query running partially in depot and partially getting fetched from communal. And the red line is data fetched from communal storage. Let's click on the one of the lines. Each data point, each point on the line will take you to the query detail page where you can see more about what's going on. So this is uh, the page that shows us what queries have been run in this particular time interval, which is uh, on top of this page in orange color. So that's about one minute time interval. And now we can see user Sherry among the users that are running queries. Sherry's query involves large tables and are running against a different schema. We can see the click, click stream schema in the name of the in part of the query request. So what is happening, there is not enough depot space for both the schema that's already in use and the one Sherry needs. As a result, evictions and fetches have started occurring. What other questions we can um, ask ourselves to help us understand what's going on? So how about what tables are most frequently refetched? So for that, we will go to the deep efficiency page and look at the middle, top middle chart here. We can see uh, the larger version of this chart if we expand it. So now we have 10 tables listed that are most frequently being refetched. We can see that there is a click stream schema and there, is, there are other schemas. So all of those tables are being used in the queries, fetched, and then there is not enough space in the depot. They're getting evicted and they again refetched again. So what can be done to enable all queries to run in depot? Option one can be increase the depot size. So we can do this by running the following queries, which specify which nodes and um, storage location and the new depot size. And I should mention that we can run this query from the management console from the query execution page. So this would have helped us to increase the depot size. What other options do we have? For example, when increasing depot size is not an option. We can also provision a second subcluster to isolate workloads like Sherry's. So we are going to do this now, and we'll provision a second subcluster using the manage page. Here we're creating subcluster for Sherry or for workloads like hers. And we are going to create it with three nodes. So Sherry subcluster has been created. We can see it here added to the list of the subclusters. It's a secondary subcluster. Sherry has been instructed to use the new Sherry subcluster for her work. Now, let's see what happens. We'll go again at uh, Depot Activity 
page and we'll look at the at a glance tab we can see that around 1807 Sherry switched to running her queries on Sherry subcluster. On the top of this uh, page you can see subcluster selected. So we currently have two subclusters and I am looking what happened to Sherry subcluster once it has been provisioned. So Sherry started using it and the uh, lines after initial patching from depot, which was a, from a communal, which was a red line. After that, all Sherry's queries fit in depot, which is indicated by green line. Also, the depot is pretty full on those nodes, about 90% uh, full, but the queries are processed efficiently. There is no spilling into communal. So that's a good case scenario. Let's now go back and take a look at the original subcluster, default subcluster. So on the left portion of the chart, you can see multiple lines. That was activity before Sherry switched to her own dedicated subcluster. At around 1807, after Sherry switched from this subcluster to using her dedicated subcluster, there is no, she, she's no longer using the subcluster, she's not putting load in it. So the lines after that are turning it green color, which means the queries that are still running in the full subcluster are all running in depot. We can also see that depot fetches and eviction bars, those purple and blue bars, are no longer showing significant numbers. Also, we can check the uh, the second chart that shows community storage access. And we can see that the bars has also dropped, so there is no significant access for, commun for communal storage. So this problem has been solved. Each of the subclusters are serving queries from depot, and that's our most efficient scenario. Let's also look at the other uh, tabs that we have for depot monitoring. Let's look at depot efficiency tab. It has six charts, and we'll go through each one of them quickly. File reach by location gives an indicator of where the majority of query execution took place, in depot or in communal. Top 10 refetches into depot, and we mentioned this chart earlier in our use case. It shows tables that are most frequently fetched and evicted and then fetched again. These are good candidates to get pinned if increasing depot size is not an option. Note that both of these charts have an option to select time interval using calendar widget so you can get the information about the activity that happened during that time interval. Depot pinning shows what portion of your depot is pinned, both by byte count and by table count. And the three tables at the bottom show depot structure. How long tables stay in depot? We would like tables to be fetched in depot and stay there for a long time. How often they are accessed? Again, the tables in depot, we would like to see them accessed frequently. And what the size range of tables in Zippel. Zippel content. This tab allows us to search for tables that are currently in Zippel and also to see stats like table size in Zippel, how often tables were accessed, and when were they last accessed. And the same information that's available for tables in depot is also available on projections and partition level for those tables. Depot pinning. This tab allows users to see what policies are currently existing. And you can do this by clicking on the first radio button and click search 
This will show you all existing policies that are already created. The second option allows you to search for a table and create a policy. You can also use the action column to uh, modify existing policies or delete them. And the third option provides details about most frequently refetched tables, including fetch count, total access count, and number of refetched bytes. So all this information can help to make decisions regarding pinning specific tables. So uh, that was about it about uh, the uh, depot. And I should mention that the server uh, team also has a very good presentation on the webinar on the um, EON mode database depot management and subcluster management that strongly recommended to attend or download the slide presentation. Let's talk uh, quickly about the Management Council roadmap. What we are planning to do in the future. So we are going to continue focusing on subcluster management. There is still a lot of things we can do here. Uh, promoting, demoting subclusters, load balancing across subclusters, scheduling subcluster actions, support for large cluster mode. We'll continue working on a workload analyzer enhancement recommendation on backup and restore from the MT, building custom threshold, and EON on HDFS support. Okay, so we are ready now to take any questions you may have now. Thank you.